<laughs> Earthbound by Artemis Greenleaf. Chapter 2 Una's House It was blood, of course. A small smear of brilliant red crept from my ear down my white jaw, the only outward sign of my fractured skull. But I wasn't upset. I felt calm and peaceful. It's hard to explain. I know it sounds corny, but it was like floating in liquid love. Then I heard someone calling me. Skylar, it's time to go. A swirling cloud tunnel suddenly opened up, not more than three feet away. I could feel it pulling on me, but I would not go into it. It wasn't that I was afraid of the tunnel. I wanted to go into it more than anything. I hadn't known it when I was alive. But I knew as soon as I died that the baby my mother carried would be a girl and I was afraid for my sister. I didn't want her to be like me, lonely and miserable, and somehow I knew she was going to need my help and I had to be there for her. Almost as soon as I decided, the tunnel collapsed and a cloud spun off, little wisps of smoke trapping me in the earth plane. I'm not sure how much I've helped Sheridan in all this time, she doesn't even know I exist, and sometimes that makes me a little sad. But I watch my dad when he drinks. He crawled into a whiskey bottle the day our mother left and sealed the rest of the world out. It cost him his job and the few friends he had. Now he and Sheridan live on the dole, and the money his older brother, my uncle Hank, sends. Dad is a mean drunk and I always push a chair or something in his way to trip him up when he goes after Sheridan. That way, he takes it out on the furniture instead of her. So far, he's only hit her once in these eight years. It took the bruise on her cheek a long time to heal, and it made me so angry every time I saw it that I went up and threw stuff round in the attic. Why wasn't our mother around to protect her? What kind of useless individual runs off and leaves her baby? She should be here, where she belongs. I don't think the homeschooling thing was going to work out with Mama. Too much commitment. Dad wasn't about to do it. Not his job. So Sheridan Attend sent Bridget's in the village. No doubt I would have ended up there too. I often go with my sister to school just to see what it would be like if I was still breathing. I watch the kids who would have been my classmates. I call them my friends. I sometimes talk to them, but they don't hear me. I've grown up with a lot of them, even if they never knew it. I'm more invisible than dirt poor Bobby Shaughnessy, who only wishes no one could see him. If I wasn't dead, I think I might have got on well with this one girl, Fiona Adams. Fiona with licorice hair that tumbles to her waist and caramel eyes. Yes, we should have been friends. Maybe she is who I'd like to be if I was alive. She's got a fella one year up. His name is Seamus and what a gorgeous thing he is. His sandy blonde hair hangs just out of his slate grey eyes. He has a beautiful mouth and he's tall and muscly. To me he looks like some Celtic hero come back from the past, like Cucullin or Finn McCool. Even so, I'm not sure I'd want his tongue in my mouth. It looks slimy, unsanitary. If I had skin, it would crawl. Fiona seems to like it though, the little sighs and sounds she makes when they go round the back of the bicycle shed for a snog during lunch break. Still, I sometimes wonder what it would feel like to kiss a boy especially a really cute one like Seamus. But I suppose I'll never know. I touched him once, ran my finger along one bumpy bicep. 
He started and pulled away, but he never saw me. As I said before, apparition is a very hard thing to learn. It takes a lot of concentration. Think of it like this. Matter and energy are really the same thing. They just vibrate at different speeds. The slower something vibrates, the more solid it feels. Us ghosts vibrate much faster than non-deads. That's why we're not often seen. The human eye can't quite get a fix, so the brain filters us out as static or background noise. To appear to most non-deads, we have to slow ourselves way down. Practice, 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 Una always tells me. She was the first one I met. She and her husband, Conal Magidja, built the original farmhouse. They never had children, so she and Connell have kind of adopted me. Sometimes she drives me crazy, but she's the closest thing to a mother I've got. Being dead isn't so bad. You have more company than you might imagine. I first met Una when Mama carried my body back into the house. The whole way back, Mama cried, saying, No, no, no! My sister was due to be born at any minute, and Dad had the car. There was no way Mama could waddle the six miles to the village for the phone. Huge and helpless, she was a beached whale stranded on this fly speck of a farm in a great ocean of nowhere. She plopped my body on the floor, where it landed like a broken doll. She collapsed onto the ramshackle sofa, put her head in her hands, and sobbed for a long time. I watched her back and shoulders heave up and down, shaking droplets of rain from her hair and arms onto the cold flagstones. I touched her shoulder and she looked up, wiping her eyes with her skirt, but she didn't see me. Damn you, Luke Ramsey, she screamed at the empty room. I hate you, I hate you for bringing me to this godforsaken place. This is all your fault. Her breath still short and ragged, she got up and lumbered off to the bedroom to lie down. I stared at the centre of her back as she left, part of me wishing I could let her know I was right there, part of me glad I couldn't. I was so surprised she was so upset. I was sure she'd be relieved to be rid of me. Maybe she deserved to suffer a little bit. It would serve her right. No, what a terrible thought! I jerked my head around and saw a young woman in a long blue dress standing near my body. This belongs to you, does it, Skylar? She looked down at my corpse. How did you know my name? Bless, child. This is my own house. I've been here for over three hundred years. I watched you move into the place, don't you know? Of course I'm going to know who you are. A few tendrils of black hair had escaped from the fat bun that sat on top of her head, softening her sharp cheekbones. Your house? How could I have not noticed? Aren't ghosts supposed to moan and groan and rattle chains during the night? Of course it's my house. My husband Connell and I built it. We came in 1683 and never left. We loved the place so. You love this place? Doesn't everyone love their own home? She smiled at me. Now, you've had a nasty shock. Save your questions for another time. Come with me. I'll get you set up with a chain to rattle. Una winked. Was it just a lucky guess or did she know my thoughts? She led me to my bedroom. The room that I would have shared with Sheridan was in the attic. There were no stairs, just a ladder that was fixed to the wall. The attic was divided more or less in half by a thin wall with a flimsy door. One side was storage, the other was the bedroom. Twin beds were tucked into opposite bedroom corners. Una patted my bed and smiled at me. Even ghosts need a rest from time to time. Have a lie down for a while. I climbed into the bed and reluctantly put my head on the pillow. I was having you on about the chain. 
No self-respecting ghost does such a thing. Una stroked my hair and kissed me on the forehead. You'll be fine. Just rest. I'll be in the kitchen. I had a warm, bubbly feeling about Una, almost like when I first died. Once the cloud tunnel in the barn closed, that liquid love drained away, and I was just me again. I smiled at her as she patted my hand. She must have been a great mother, I thought. My mind drifted with the dust particles that swam in the grey half-light from the tiny window. I gradually became aware of my parents shouting at each other. I didn't want to listen. I wanted to hide in the corner like I always did when they fought. I pressed against the wall, expecting to feel the rough coolness of stone. Instead, I found myself outside, floating in the air. Laughter crackled all around me. Bit awkward at first. Lots to learn. A man in Renaissance fair clothes sat on a pile of stones, chuckling. Thick brown hair shrouded his grey eyes. He had probably been a handsome man when he had some meat on his bones. Skeletal legs poked out of a thick wooden tunic that almost covered his knees. His linen shirt sagged over his bone-thin arms. Even though the leather belt around his waist was in the last hole, it was too big. He reminded me of a child playing dress-up in his dad's clothes. A thin and starving child. Are you Connell? The very same, he said, bowing his head just a little. Then he floated off the stones to the ground. Come on down here, will you? I don't know how. He grinned at me and rose up, until he could take hold of my shoe. He pulled me down, like a maverick party balloon, and set me on the ground. "'Have you been to the sea lately?' he asked. We could see the cold slate ocean from the house. Mama and I walked down to the cliff once, before she got pregnant. "'You stay away from here, you understand?' she had said. No, I haven't been there for a while, I said. Come on then, Una is waiting for us there. He glided across the field like an ice skater. But it was hard work for me. I was trying to pick my way through the stones, because walking was the only way I knew how to get around. Connell saw me struggling and slowed down. It's a bit different, getting from place to place. Just think where you want to go. I looked at a lichen-covered boulder and tried to think myself onto it. I started to wobble, and suddenly I was inside the rock, with only my head sticking out. It does take some practice, don't you know? I could tell he was trying not to laugh at me. Then he reached out his hand and said, Here, I'll help you. When I touched his hand, I was pulled along behind him as he slid effortlessly over the ground. I thought of the little magnetic train set I had in my room. Now I know exactly how the caboose feels. I could see Una standing on the edge of the cliffs, a shining mist in the setting sun. There was something different about her. She seemed perhaps a little brighter, or more substantial than Connell. Evening, Skyler. Hiya, Una. Lovely sunset, that, she said. Connell let go of my hand and went to stand next to her, putting his arm around her waist. Even though they were wispy, transparent ghosts, it was plain that they loved each other very much. I wished my parents had been like that. Then I walked to the edge of the cliffs too. I didn't dare try gliding. I looked down into the boiling sea. The orange, red and pink reflected off the clouds onto the water like a giant had spilled a paint box on the ocean. We stayed there, saying nothing, until it was fully dark. A thin crescent moon was a fingernail clinging to the thick velvet sky. Rhinestone stars glittered and crowded together against the chill of the night. The sighing of the sea sounded like a lullaby, and I suddenly felt I should be sleepy, so I sat down. 
Una turned towards the farm. They're finished, I believe. I wasn't sure what she meant, but I was too timid to ask. She took my right hand and Connell took my left. We glided back across the rocky field to the house in almost no time. The guard I were just leaving, lights flashing. One white and yellow police car led a black van, and another followed it. Now I understood. My death had been investigated and the body taken away. A single drop of blood marked the spot where my corpse had lain. Connell and I have some things to do. Why don't you practice gliding in your room? Una smiled at me, stroking my arm. Being touched by ghosts just feels weird. We aren't solid, but we do have boundaries. So it's a mixing of energy, a swirling, tickly feeling. That's not quite satisfying. Okay. I wanted to be alone anyway. Too much had happened to me today. I needed some downtime to make sense of it all. Before I knew it, it was morning. I got up and looked in Mama and Dad's room. No one was there, so I went into the kitchen. Your Ma and Da are out making the arrangements, Una told me. Arrangements? For your funeral child, she said, not unkindly. Oh, I sat down at the table. I was already getting good at resisting matter. I didn't want to think about my very own personal death. Anything but that just now. So I asked her about the farm. She told me how she and Connell had inherited a plot of land from his uncle and built the place by hand, stone by stone. It was back-breaking work, but they were happy. They got even happier when they found out a baby was on the way. And then they died from cholera that spring, before the baby was born. I would have cried if I could have. Don't be sad, child. We love this old farm. Now we've no worries of hunger. It's good just to be here, in this place we worked so hard to build. Connell and I, we're here together for as long as we want to be. Forever, if we like, she smiled. I had thought happily ever after would be different. Skylar, she said, leaning forward and putting her hands over mine. Everything that lives will also die. What is important is what you leave behind when you go. If you've made something beautiful, done kind things for others, loved people, that's what life is all about. Don't fret about death. It's just a little change. Some people don't even notice it. Una stood up. You should spend more time outside. Outside? Yes. You might be surprised at who you'd meet. I looked out the window, and my eye caught the gaudy orange clock Mama had hung above it. We'd been talking for over an hour. My parents would probably be back soon. I went outside. Una was right. Before my body had spent two nights in the casket, I'd met the other three ghosts who called the farm home. Began, the sad Australian, and Connie with her horse Nim would become like my extended family over the years. At the time, I had no idea how much I would be needing them, or how much that friendship would cost. Earthbound by Artemis Greenleaf. This work is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivative Works 3.0 United States License. Environmental sound effects used in this podcast were provided by www.freesound.org. Please check artemisgreenleaf.com for details of specific samples used. If you'd like to leave a comment or learn more about the other projects in progress, please go to www.artemisgreenleaf.com.
dandelion girl Watch her play 